Ah, Disneyland Paris, the most magical place on earth, and accessible in just over two hours by the high-speed Eurostar under the sea. That is until June the 5th, 2023, when the service was seized to enable Eurostar to focus on its core routes following Brexit and post-pandemic challenges. I rode this service back in December 2022 to experience what it was like before it was axed earlier this week. Now let's get this show on the rails as the Eurostar Disneyland services reach the end of the line. Oh wait, as usual, I'm getting way too ahead of myself. We have to get to St Pancras first. A quick hop on the tube will get us there in no time flat. Welcome to London St Pancras International, one of the finest railway termini the UK has to offer. Despite its major role as the gateway to mainland Europe in the present day, this magnificent 1868-built Great One listed structure was under threat of closure in the 1960s. Had it not been for the successful campaigning by demonstrators at the time, I could well have been doing this video from a different location. Entering the station sees us being greeted by the original train shed, perhaps its most impressive feature. It's something that's mesmerised me ever since I've been coming to the station as a child. Oh, and do take note of the I Want My Time With You statue by artist Tracy Emin from 2018. Arriving into the platform now is one of Eurostar's flagship E320 trains. Whilst we won't be travelling on one of these today, do check out the link above for my video on one from Paris to London. St Pancras is a far cry from its derelict days back in the 1960s. Annually, the station sees over 50 million people visiting it a year, and not just for travel. One in six are simply here to enjoy the many shops present within the station. This is principally thanks to Eurostar services moving over to St Pancras in November 2007 from Waterloo International to coincide with the opening of the HS1 line to the Channel Tunnel. The building just across from us is King's Cross Station, which serves destinations in the East Anglia, East Midlands, North East and Scotland along Britain's busy East Coast mainline. Other operators here include EMR Connect and Intercity services along the Midland Main Line, Cross London Thameslink services and South Eastern Domestic High Speed services along the HS1, which combined with the underground and neighbouring King's Cross provides an array of travel options, both to travel in or out of the UK. Outside of today, I know which option I'd choose. Well that was a great way to kill some time, as our train's almost ready to board. Eurostar boarding opens two hours before departure and closes half an hour before, so do leave plenty of time to arrive. It's recommended to arrive around an hour and a half to an hour prior to departure, to ensure minimal delays are caused. I did this journey just before the height of the Christmas period, so even at 8 in the morning the queues are incredibly long. Quite a lot of them heading to Disneyland too, judging from the large array of Mickey Mouse ears. Much later. Okay, we're finally near the front of the queue, so let's go through the boarding process for Eurostar. The boarding process begins with scanning your ticket on the barcode reader to enter the barriers. Tickets can either be printed, offered as paper tickets, or, the option I chose, as an e-ticket. Following this, a brief and quick security check is conducted. Unlike the plane, there's no need to remove liquids and electronics, and it's fairly simple from my experience. Access to the departure lounge is then granted following two passport checks one by the British national authorities and another by the French to grant access to the European Schengen area which the UK isn't a part of. Unlike the Paris lounge, I do find the London one to be rather crowded in a similar manner to the Amsterdam one, but that's a subject for a future video. In the meantime, all we can do is sit back and wait for our train to board. Just to our right is the Eurostar Business Premier lounge, available to those on a Business Premier ticket or Eurostar Carte Blanche members. 
Though strangely enough for the Disneyland service, business premiere tickets aren't available. Or at least when I was booking. Not that it's ever worth the price tag anyways. Let's get ready, as boarding should be commencing shortly. Or at least that's what I thought. Issues at the depot meant that our train will now be delayed by over an hour. Fortunately, I don't have any connecting services on arrival into Disneyland, so this isn't too much of an inconvenience. At least it isn't cancelled. Now we wait a bit longer. Much, much, much later. An hour later, my patience had been rewarded, as it was finally time to board our Eurostar bound for Disneyland. I'm incredibly excited. This is my first trip with Eurostar since 2015, so back when their fleet solely consisted of our train today, the Class 373 TGV TMST. Eurostar has a total of eight of these trains, which it refurbished in the 2010s and rebranded them as E300s when the newer E320s were introduced. The trains have been used since Eurostar services began in 1994, and the remainder of the original fleet of 38 have either since been scrapped, preserved, or stored both at on- or off-site locations, like the example here, stored at Eurostar's Temple Mills depot. Our train is due to leave imminently thanks to the delay, so I'll get a photo of our unit when we arrive. For this trip, I booked Standard Premier, one of two first-class offerings provided by Eurostar. It was just a bit more expensive than Standard, but I'll get into that at the end of the video. This will be my seat for the two and a half hour trip to Disneyland today, as we blast across the HS1 at 300 km per hour through Essex and Kent into the Channel Tunnel. After emerging in France and traversing the LGV North, we make a stop at Lille in northern France, ahead of our anticipated arrival into mont la vallee at approximately 3pm Central European time. Despite the delay, I'm really looking forward to bringing you on this trip, and it should be a great one, so sit back and enjoy the ride. Our departure from London is around an hour late, and greeted with a fantastic snowscape from a few nights before. Next stop, Lille Europe in France. I'd also like to take this chance to say I hope you're enjoying the video so far, and if you'd like to support me further, the best way to do that is subscribing. It's free of charge and is the best way to support me in my work going forward to help make bigger and better videos. Thanks! Shortly after leaving St Pancras, we speed through the HS1 White Elephant, Stratford International. The snow is just a coincidence. Despite the name and intent by Eurostar to stop here for the London 2012 Olympic Games, no international services have ever called here. The name remains to distinguish it from Stratford Regional Station, just down the road. This portion of the line sees us run parallel to the Tilbury branch served by C2C services. A large amount of freight traffic for overseas goods also runs on both routes. It isn't much longer until we find ourselves passing the Dartford Crossing, a toll bridge over the River Thames that has been a vital link between Essex and Kent since 1991. I feel like now is a better time than ever to check out the train's features, starting with the seat. Having suffered ironing board seats basically the whole of 2022, this was a refreshing change, one of the comfiest seats I've ever sat on. There are also foldable armrests on the aisle side of the seat, though I was surprised the window side wasn't, given this being necessary to access the UK or European power and USB type A socket, depending on which side you end up sitting on. A reading light is located on the window side too, which worked pretty well and was fairly simple to activate through the switch next to the power socket. The legroom and seat pitch were both very generous, though bear in mind that no one was sitting opposite me the entire trip. I can still imagine this being the case regardless. This is aided further by the seat recline, which is activated by pulling the lever and sliding your body forwards and backwards as appropriate. The seat indicators aren't as fancy as an E320, but simplicity is often quite effective. Table seats in Standard and Business Premier provide retractable extensions, which are useful for when the meals are provided. 
More on that in a little while. And finally, there's a window blind available. Interestingly, it doesn't completely block out the view and instead simply reduces the sunlight, which I find to be a lot better as this means the views over the HS1 can still be enjoyed. My favourite part of the HS1 is the Medway Viaduct, which enables us to traverse the River Medway and view some very picturesque landscape, especially with the snow. The HS1 itself is rather unique in that it is the only part of the British Rail Network built to European gauges. The maximum speed is 300 km per hour, though we're not quite there owing to the earlier delay, but we are close. Ashford International, visible down below from one of the many HS1 viaducts, which, along with Ebbsfleet, is a former stop of the Eurostar that was withdrawn for the same reasons as the Disneyland service. There is no expected date for the return of Eurostar services at Ashford, and this is despite the works done in late 2019 to make the platform suitable for the E320s, which are built to the European loading gauge. Standard Premier offers a light meal included with the cost of your ticket. I do love how Eurostar have included a halal option, though it's nothing really to write home about. It was still delicious nonetheless, and just in time too. We're now beginning to slow down as we enter the Channel Tunnel, which is capped at a maximum speed of 100 miles per hour. As well as Eurostar services, the channel is also served by the motorrail shuttle service, the Shuttle, between Calais and Folkestone, one of which can be seen to the right as it arrives into Folkestone Terminal. The Channel Tunnel is an engineering marvel, with plans for its construction emerging as early as 1802. The eventual successful project, led by Eurotunnel, began construction in 1988 and opened in May 1994, with several Class 319 electric trains making excursions through the tunnel from Sandling, Kent, on the day of opening with invited guests, two making it all the way to France as the first passenger carrying trains to do so, but I'll cover this further in a future video. As we enter the tunnel, you may notice two things. One, it's not like a scene from Finding Nemo, and two, we actually have a pretty decent signal down here, you know, lack of 4G aside. The tunnel has two tunnels, one in each direction, both of which are linked by a piston relief duct to manage air pressure changes caused by the fast train movement. There is also a service tunnel between the two tunnels for the provision of maintenance and the evacuation of passengers in the event of an emergency. The tunnel also runs 75 metres below sea level, which is pretty amazing if you ask me. Each tunnel also has a length of around 50.45 kilometres, approximately 31 miles, and takes 20 minutes to traverse the full length, so let's use this lack of scenery as a chance to do a quick walkthrough. Standard and Business Premier is in a 2 plus 1 seating consist, and makes up 6 of the whopping 18 carriages on this TMST set. Last time I travelled with Eurostar, the interior of the E300s looked like this, which certainly is a stark contrast to what it looks like now. Here is Café Metropole, Eurostar's onboard café bar, and as can be seen it's incredibly popular today, so I'll come back here a bit later. For now, let's head into Standard Class, which is in a 2x2 configuration, with both airline style and table seats. Despite being two carriages longer than the newer E320 trains, the E300s are only able to carry 750 passengers, vice 902 able to be seated by the E320s, mainly owing to the shorter length of the carriages and less efficient use of space. I'm going to leave the walkthrough here so we can have a chance to check out the toilets, of which I've gone for a standard toilet this time. And door locked, we can begin! As to be expected from Eurostar, the toilet is rather clean and it really does match well with the rest of the train's interior from my point of view. Everything in the toilet works as well as it should too, so I'll give it a thumbs up. Right, let's head back to our seat as we emerge into France out of the Channel Tunnel. And we have now emerged from the tunnel onto the European mainland. Bienvenue à la France! You may also notice the large amount of fencing as we pass through Calais in northern France, an attempt to resolve the illegal immigration issues through the Channel Tunnel. Your journey. Just exit into the Channel Tunnel. 
I later returned to Café Metropole, as the crowds had long since cleared, so I bought some snacks, seeing as I was still a bit hungry. And it wasn't cheap either, considering I didn't even buy much. I put the menu in the description below, so you can make your own judgement. In the meantime, I can enjoy my food speeding along the LGV Nord, the high speed line that runs from the Channel Tunnel portal to Paris, which was opened in 1993. As with the HS1, the maximum line speed is 300 km per hour, or 186 miles per hour. We continue to traverse the line up to our first and only intermediate stop of Lille Europe, which, as the name suggests, was built to serve international high speed services along the LGV Nord. Eurostar Paris bound services don't stop here, but other Eurostar services do for most of the day, including the Disneyland one, which, as we all know, has long since ceased. We now diverge off of the LGV Nord and onto the LGV Interconnexion Est which, as the name suggests, is a high-speed line linking the former with the LGVs Atlantique and Sud-Est towards other destinations in France. There are only two stops on the route, one of which we are making an unexpected stop at right now, paris Charles de gaulle Airport Terminal 2. Terminal 1 is served by the RER Line B only, whereas Terminal 2 is served by both high-speed TGV and RER services. This now brings our delay to just over 90 minutes. As we head away again, let me summarise today's trip. Despite the delay, it was very enjoyable. The staff were incredibly friendly, the ride was comfortable, and I got to take a ride on the iconic TMST once again. I honestly didn't feel as though the price was reflective of the journey though, something I'm noticing more and more with Eurostar these days. Nevertheless, I managed to claim a refund voucher of 30% of my ticket cost, which, whilst not as generous as the UK, will come in great use in the future. It's honestly a shame that the service is being axed too. As you can see throughout the video, it was very well used. Passengers from London will now have to change at Lille or Paris for onward TGV connections to marne la vallee which is less convenient and doesn't bode well for rail travel going forwards. For now though, bienvenue à Parc Disneyland. And that's it guys, welcome to Mont la vallee for possibly the last time on a Eurostar train. That being said, whilst it is axed, it is being placed under review to return by Eurostar and is still served by sister brand Talis, so it's hopefully will be seeing a comeback. I do hope you've enjoyed the video today and thanks so much for coming along with me on this ride. If you did enjoy the video, please do give it a like as well as share it as that really does help the channel to grow. If you're new to the channel and want to see more content such as this, why not consider subscribing as well as enabling notifications as I upload new videos every Friday at 5pm. Well it's now time to enjoy the delights of the most magical place on earth before heading into my accommodation in central Paris. Thanks so much for watching and until next time, I'll see you around.